all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show and there is a study from ucla department of molecular and medical pharmacology the study is amazing what this study says is that gaba if used early during the sars cov2 infection then it reduces the severity and it reduces the deaths by covid it reduces the severity of covid reduces the deaths by covid it's a beautiful study so here is drbean.com in the description there is a link if you would like to have access to the drbean.com to the more lectures there this is the study it is a preprint study it is a study done on mice it's not a human in human studies but this study has actually shown or demonstrated a benefit of gaba that i think can be seen by more researchers so that they can start using this in their research plus there can be clinical trials that can use gaba in there as well gaba as dr uh, professor uh, dr daniel kaufman who is one of the authors here researchers here he as he noted gaba is cheap or inexpensive easily available worldwide stable at room temperature off the shelf in most in many countries or over the counter in many countries and as you would see here very beneficial if provided if administered early so i think i would use this to put this molecule gaba in the early treatment category as well so let's start a discussion so these are our gifts for humanity apologies that today it became a little soundless in the beginning fascinating new study it is a preprint by jaid tian arbra j dilian bill henley lucio kumai and daniel l kaufman most important part so there is a lot in this study but what struck me the most was the following imagine we have a few groups of mice one group of mice so this big mouse is representing a group of mice one group of mice was fed their food plus given water plain water another group of mice was fed and given water that had gaba in it 0.2 mg per ml gaba there was another group of mice that was that was also given water with gaba but that was 2 mg per ml gaba these mice were k18 a2 mice so they did have a2 enzyme expression on their epithelial lung cells and what did the researchers find this is fascinating i think just if you can take away two things from here number one what was the result on severity and death and secondly what was the dose then that is complete summary so let me reach there soon first of all what was the result within if you started gaba within the first two days of the infection with sars-cov-2 then here was the result within 7 8 days of infection in the control group that was not getting gaba virus load was high deaths were more inflammation was more severity was more so the control groups 0.2 mg gaba or 2 mg gaba per ml these control group mice had less viral load they had less severe disease they had less lung coefficient index and the researcher said that coefficient index for lung is if you take a mouse or for that matter a human being if you take a mouse and you take the proportion of the lung weight to their body weight then that is the coefficient and now if you look at a mouse whose lungs are inflamed that means the lungs have water filling in them 
congestion has occurred, this mouse's lungs will be swollen, will be inflamed and heavier compared to the rest of the body as compared to another mouse that is healthy. So they saw that the lung coefficient index in, in the uh, GABA-treated mice was less, meaning their lungs, these mice that were treated with GABA, their lungs were lighter. That means less inflammation, less congestion, less accumulation of fluid was observed. Number of deaths or death rate was less. Can you imagine how less in this group within seven to eight days? Those mice that were not given GABA, 80% of them died, 20% survived. And those mice that were given GABA, administered GABA, 80% survived and 20% died. So 20% survival versus 80% survival. Researchers, then they also found, which is, this is fascinating, and I, I will discuss that in a little more de detail later on. They found that the cytokines and chemokines that are released in patient's blood, patient being mouse control or uh, GABA administered mouse, in the GABA mouse, the cytokines and chemokines were more of the anti-inflammatory type, more of those kind that would help immune system stay balanced and stay modulated towards the balance. Compared to the control group where there were lots of pro-inflammatory molecules running around in their body, mice's body. So then the question would be, why did they do this? Why did they have this study? And um, Professor Kaufman sent his rationale. He said that those researchers that had been working with the lung gas exchanges, these researchers had noted that those patients, human patients of SARS-CoV-2, that were receiving GABA for some reason, for whatever reason, these patients had less ventilation injury compared to those who were not receiving GABA. That observation prompted this team to say, you know what, let's see what is the effect of GABA on the lung tissue cells and on the immune system. So beautiful study. Continuing. So the takeaway here, less, less deaths, less severity of the disease, less viral load within seven, eight days. So what did they observe? They observed, so here are, let's say, this is a group of mice that is infected by SARS-CoV-2 or representation of SARS-CoV-2. And they were just given plain water to drink. Here is another group of mice. They look very similar to the other guys. And they were also infected with SARS-CoV-2, but they were given water with GABA in it. Seven, eight days later, here, 20% survived plain water. On the GABA side, 80% survived. GABA, this is over the counter. It is, it is so inexpensive, over the counter available product in many countries. In some countries, it is regulated as a medical substance, but in most countries, it is over the counter. And the p-values were significant meaning this was not just a by chance, it was a significant outcome. And I'll show you that result on their charts as well. Now, here is the important part of the summary, how much GABA was used. So 0 0.2 milligram per milliliter and two milligram per milliliter for mice. And the mice were consuming 3.5 milliliter of water daily. 
So if you take these numbers, 3.5 milliliter water daily for mice and water containing 0.2 milli, milli, milligram per milliliter of GABA, and you extrapolate that for humans, then for a human of 70 kilogram weight, 0.68 gram per day of GABA is the dose. Again, this is not a medical advice here. This is the dose calculation that the researchers did as well. Why did they do the dose calculation? For the next researchers who may put this in human trials. For these researchers, for the next ones, this is the kind of dose to look at. And this dose is within the safety limits of GABA administration. So researchers say that with this data, human research clinical trials are needed. And finally, finishing the summary, then we'll go in detail, limitations of this study. They say there are a number of major limitations of the study. First, the K18HAS2. So these are the mice that have human AS2 on their cells. So these mouse model imperfectly models SARS-CoV-2 infection and immune response in humans. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Number two, GABA's impact on immune cells and lung cells may differ in important ways between mouse, mice, and humans. Makes sense. That is why human trials should be done. Third, GABA treatment may only be beneficial during a specific time window of the disease process and at other times it may be deleterious. This is actually important. GABA can cause production of cytokines that might become deleterious. So it is important to note that this is within the first couple of days, as soon as the disease is starting. Accordingly, careful clinical trials are needed to determine the time window and dosage, if any, that GABA receptor agonist treatment has a beneficial effect in COVID-19 patients. So this is the this is a summary of it. Now let's look at some of the details. So to look at the details, I'm going to go over our standard regular immune chart that we usually work with. The thing is, I'm, I'm repeating this one because many of the recent lectures, there are newer cool beans as well, and they ask, what is this molecule or what is that cell? So just a big review of a bigger picture. So here is the innate arm. Innate arm of the immune system is the arm that is tasked to be the first responder. This arm, the cells in here and the molecules, they all just attack anything that is foreign, that is not body, that is not self. They don't care what it is. They are not trained to attack a specific type. They would just attack, attack anything that is not self. So on the innate arm, in the innate arm, there are cells like natural killer cells. I always make them with this little eye patch on them. I always call them pervert cells as well because what they do is they touch every other cell. This is actually their job. Their job is to touch other cells and assess the health of the cells. If the cell does not appear to be healthy because maybe that cell is infected with a virus or is cancerous, then natural killer cell would kill the other cell immediately on the spot. So natural killer cells are part of the innate arm. Macrophages are part of the innate arm system. Dendritic cells are part of innate arm system. Neutrophils are part of this. And then there are nowadays some other lymphocytes as well. But this is generally the innate arm. Here, this is the acquired arm. Acquired arm is made up of T cells and B cells. T cells in turn are divided into two groups, T helpers, T cytotoxic, this is one, two groups, and then B cells are either active or not active. So usually what happens is, and if you can pay attention to this part because we'll use some of these concepts a little later. So usually what happens is when a foreign substance, foreign offending agent enters, for example, let's say SARS-CoV-2. Our innate arm connects 
interacts with that pathogen, eats it up, phagocytoses it, breaks it down, presents that to the helper side or the acquired arm. Acquired arm, normally the T helper zero cells or naive T cells, they bind the antigen presenting cell, which is dendritic cells, macrophages. And once the helper cell is bound with the antigen presenting cell, then depending upon what interleukin is present in the environment, interleukin 4 versus interleukin 12, if interleukin 4 is present in the environment, then T help, helper 0 will become T helper 2. And this will become the humoral pathway. This T helper 2 in turn will produce interleukin 4, 5, 6, 10 and many other. And one of the function of interleukin 4 and 5 is to cause B cells to become activated, proliferated and differentiated. Meaning, in summary, this is the pathway to start making antibodies. And this is the pathway to start killing the infected cells. So here, in the presence of interleukin-12, this interleukin-12 is usually released by macrophages or dendritic cells, in addition to many other cells. Interleukin-12's presence causes T helper 0 cell or naive T cell to become T helper 1 cell. T helper 1 cell in turn releases interleukin 2, which I did not write here, and that interleukin 2 would activate cytotoxic T cells or CD8 plus cells. There is another subset of cells which are called T regulatory cells, which are also activated from T helper 0 cells. And that's a quick idea of what researchers found. They found in the presence of GABA. So let me back up for a second. They found that GABA receptors, or they know that GABA receptors are on the immune cells as well. GABA receptors are basically present on our brain, central nervous system neurons. But GABA receptors are also present on the lung epithelium. They're also present on the immune system cells. So when the GABA receptors are activated, the immune system changes its behavior. And the innate arm shifts in its behavior from pro-inflammatory to sort of anti-inflammatory. That's the first change, very important change. The second is that interleukin-10 secretion increases. And we have done this discussion in the past. Interleukin-10 released by T helper 2 and many other cells actually causes an effect on the innate arm to kind of regulate innate arms towards anti-inflammatory or calms it down. It is not suppressive, but it is modulatory. They found that more interleukin-10 was produced. They also found that more T regulatory cells were produced, which means, remember we have done this discussion that T regulatory cells function is to calm down the inflammation, is to reduce the inflammation. So what happens is our body starts attacking some foreign offending agent in that process, inflammation starts, then regulatory cells come in and they say, you know what, guys, enough, stop now or reduce your activity now. So they're kind of controlling mechanism, switching off mechanism. They found that in the presence of GABA, the T regulatory activity was promoted. GABA was helping reduce pro-inflammatory activities and increase anti-inflammatory activities or balancing, modulating activities. Okay, so now let's continue. They said in their study, they said that we were surprised at some behaviors of GABA. So imagine you're a researcher, you're going to now do research on GABA. They said the first thing to note is if GABA is anti-inflammatory, for example, then you don't want to give it in the early part of the infection because the inflammatory system's behavior is to help kill the cells that are infected and to help reduce the viral load. So if you give anti-inflammatory 
that suppress the immune system, then the virus would have a more happy time replicating and increasing. So they said, we thought giving GABA early would actually be bad. But instead they found out that giving, administering GABA early change the whole balance and the innate arm, instead of becoming suppressed, actually improved towards less severity of the COVID disease. And they say that we, we're not fully sure what are the exact mechanisms that are at play. And they have given a hypothesis or some ideas of the mechanism. I'll go over them. But the first surprise for them was it is actually needed in the early part instead of the later part. So that is one. Second, they saw that administering GABA reduced the viral load. So then the question became, so imagine we are all researchers. We're trying to figure out why did the load of the viral, the viral load reduce? So one possibility is that maybe GABA is breaking down the virus. But GABA doesn't do that. It's not a protease. GABA is not, remember we, we look at Paxlovid's or other drugs. So there are proteases, there are three CL pro blockers, there are M pro blockers and so on. GABA doesn't do any of that. So then how come it reduces the activity? So this was another surprise for them. So here is what they hypothesize. Number one, they know that GABA does not interact with ACE2 or with spike protein. So it is not that it is actually kind of mechanically sitting between these two things and reducing the infection. Instead, they think, see in this diagram. First, let's look at just this part. These are two neurons. GABA is a neurotransmitter in the brain, in the central nervous system. So when the neurotransmitter is released, GABA. The neuron that receives GABA on its receptor, there are channels, chloride channels that open up and chloride moves in the cell. So chloride is a negative ion. When it goes in the cell, the cell becomes more negative. I remember it like this, that more negative cells do not work negativity causes the cell not to function, just like negativity causes us to not function as well. So when the chloride goes in the cell, the cell doesn't function very good, very nicely. So cell is hyperpolarized and activity is reduced. In some times, we actually want to reduce activity. Now, here in the outside of the central nervous system, that is lung epithelium or immune system, researchers are hypothesizing that GABA is connected with the chloride channels here as well. But instead of letting the chloride come in, GABA is, this is a known part, GABA allows the chloride to be effluxed, removed, gone out. This is known. Now, here is a virus. They write it in their, their uh, manuscript. They say that there are viruses, including coronaviruses, that are known to bring calcium in the cell. Calcium is positive. Maybe they, these cells, these pathogens are using the positivity within the cell for their advantage. Plus, the calcium has its own function as well. For example, whenever the, inside the cell things are trafficking, things are moving, calcium is needed for them. For example, let's say muscles, they use calcium to have the contractile mechanisms go. For example, neuro ne nervous system, calcium is needed there as well for nerve conduction. Similarly, other movements of little molecules within the cell are also, they also use calcium. I remember when I was in medical college, I used to visualize calcium as a tiny little string that you tie to something and pull that thing. So whenever the movement occurs, calcium is usually there. Calcium is also there when there is damage that occurs to a tissue, 
that tissue, if the damage is repeated and continuous, then the tissue will become calcified as a defense mechanism. Here, all we can understand is that the pathogen may be trying to make the cell more positive. But when you push the chloride out, you are making the cell less positive, sorry, even more positive because you've removed some chloride. So intracellular environment has become imbalanced. Because of that imbalance, the cellular function changes. That is the hypothesis. What is the change that they observed? The change that they observed was the following. Alveolar T cell, let, let me go to the cell for a second. So here is an alveolus. Alveolus is the last little balloon where the gas exchange occurs in our lungs. Alveoli have two types of cells in them. They have many other types, but the walls of the alveoli have two main types of cells. One is the alveolus or the alveolar type 2 pneumocyte and the other one is alveolar type 1 pneumocyte or simply type 2 pneumocyte and type 1 pneumocyte. These type 2 pneumocyte or AT2 as we call them, these are little cuboidal cells. They have a function of producing surfactant which is a fluid inside the alveoli that keeps the alveolus open and patent. And, and 82 cells are very important for repair. They produce other pneumocytes plus their own cells. They are in that way, they're kind of stem cells. These 82 cells, 82 cells, also have GABA receptors on them. And when their GABA receptors are stimulated, these cells' behavior becomes anti-inflammatory. They release more surfactant, they release less inflammatory components, and generally this area becomes more protected and less inflamed. Beautiful, beautiful study. I really loved it. So let's go back here for a second. So what they found was that these, these cells had more chloride and then we should have one second. I Instead of writing chloride, I wrote calcium. This chloride efflux was protective. That's what they saw. They saw that the pneumocytes their secretion were altered. Alveolar surfactant, the fluid inside the alveolus, that production increased. Inflammatory response changed and autophagy was changed. These together became protective for the lung tissue. Then they had another interesting surprise. This was they saw that the cytokines and chemokines, the, these are the molecules that are running around in the body after a fight starts, after inflammation starts. So wherever the inflammation is happening, there are immune cells over there, there are viral or bacteria or cancer or fungus, whatever is the offending agent, that is there and then there are cells that are dying and that are being broken down and cells that are fighting. So in that area, cytokines and chemokines are being produced. Those would also go in the blood circulation. The function of some of these molecules is to go to liver and say, hey, liver, make more proteins that will be used for the fight. These are called acute phase proteins for inflammation, for example, C-reactive proteins and so on. Complement cascade, complement proteins. The fever is also a result of those initial interleukins that are produced. Similarly, other immune cells are called in to the area of inflammation. Bone marrow is asked to make more cells for inflammation. So these 
chemokines and cytokines that are just running around. It's not just that we have more of those molecules. These molecules are actually causing an effect. These are helping bring the immune cells to the area of inflammation to increase the fight over there. And researchers found that in the presence of GABA, this whole mechanism becomes balanced almost towards the anti-inflammatory state. So what they saw was, number one, type 1 interferon increased. Tumor necrosis factor alpha reduced. Now tumor necrosis factor alpha reduction also means that within the cells, the inflammatory chain nuclear factor K beta, which is also modulated by vitamin D, that was reduced in its function. And it happens both in mice and humans. Interleukin-6 production was reduced. And interleukin-6 is an important interleukin. It goes and acts on the uh, liver and does more uh, inflammatory responses. It re reduced from 10.6 to 6.3 microgram per milliliter. Then serum IP10 levels reduced. They said that we had observed, or other researchers had observed, that severe COVID patients had more serum IP10. Severe COVID patient also had less serum GABA. So giving GABA generally is useful. And this is, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in the beginning, or I mentioned it in the last talk, which was muted. Uh, this whole study was inspired by the other research work where researchers who work on the on the lung tissue and anesthesia their observations were that if gaba is present then ventilation injury to the patient is reduced so these researchers Prof professor kaufman and his team they were saying what may be the reason why not we figure this out this is how they did this study. So severe COVID patients generally have lower GABA levels in their circulation. So giving GABA, administering GABA is generally good. And secondly, here are the mechanisms. So one more is that serum IP10 is reduced by GABA. And there is a correlation here that in severe patients, IP10 is increased. Now IP10 when that is increased, it causes macrophages, monocytes, T cell, natural killer cells to be attracted to the area of inflammation through CXCR3 positive, uh, CXCR3 mechanism. So CXCR is the chemokine system. CXCR3 is chemokine 3 receptor on macrophages, monocytes, T cells, and NK cells. So when they are stimulated, they come to the area of the inflammation and fight there. GABA reduces IP10, which in turn would reduce the activity and arrival of macrophages, monocytes, T cells, NK cells at the area of inflammation. Interferon gamma was reduced. Interferon gamma, one way that it is active during an inflammation is that this CD8 cell, these CD4 cells, they can produce interferon gamma in return and they can activate the immune system's innate arm. This is what is called interleukin-12 interferon gamma axis. That innate arm produces interleukin-12. In return, the acquired arm cytotoxic side produces interferon gamma. So that is kind of an axis that increases inflammation. And the researchers found that GABA, GABA had helped reduce interferon gamma. It had helped reduce ECL2, which they said was protective, possibly protective towards death. Because they're saying that those who do not die, or those uh, patients, mice that didn't die, they had low CCL2s. Interleukin-10 was reduced. Now, interleukin-10 is generally anti-inflammatory, but it is modulatory as well. So, in general, cytokines, chemokines, immune cells' behavior 
and the lung tissue cells behavior. These were all modulated towards a lower or lesser severe disease, lesser inflammation, better protected cells. So finally, inflammatory molecule secretion in vitro is reduced by GABA for human cells. Reduced immune cell infiltration for rodents, as we just discussed, that in mice. Neutrophil activity is reduced, which is very useful. Platelet activity is reduced by GABA, which is also very useful collectively to reduce the thrombosis. So, inexpensive mostly over the counter actually let me show you some of the countries i believe they it, this is a long study actually why not we actually go over some of these charts as well while well, i'm going to go down to the countries where gaba is so here if you see this one is the blue ones are control this is mean illness score so they must have various symptoms and they said severity of the symptom would give us a score and here the blue one is control these were given plain water and look at their severity versus these red and black ones are given GABA so their severity was less after seven eight days versus controls similarly if you see here this is the percent survival so as the days passed, the blue one survived less and the red and black survived more. Then here, this is the mean, these are the titers. So if you see here, virus titer or the viral load, this is control, this is GABA. And these are statistically significant numbers. I want to go to the end of this paper and I want to read a part of this. So here, GABA is regarded as safe for human use and is available as a dietary supplement in the USA, China, Japan and much of Europe. In other countries, because GABA is a non-protein amino acid, it is regulated as a medicine or medicinal agent or drug for example in the UK, Canada and Australia. So these are, so Canada, Australia, UK, GABA may not be over the counter, but countries like US, China, Japan, Europe, majority of Europe, GABA may be available. So first of all, thanks to Dr. Kaufman for sending in this study and congratulations for doing this beautiful study. Secondly, the summary. Let's see if I can present the summary in one minute. GABA is inexpensive. It is over the counter. It is stable at room temperature. It is immunomodulator. And in the mice study, it has shown to reduce the severity, viral load, and death in mice that were given GABA that GABA dose, if translated to humans, is within the safety limit of GABA for humans. So that is the basic summary of this. Thank you very much for, for being here. Please like, subscribe, and share. I would edit out some of the initial parts where I was asking if you can hear me or not. Please like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> Zainal Amin says, what is GABA? Gamma amino butyric acid. It is a non amino non protein amino acid. It is a neurotransmitter that is used vastly within our brain. But if administered from outside, this is the benefit, at least in the mice, that is observed. M. Gregory says, "Thank you, mice." Yes. <laughs> It is your mom says, very interesting, thank you, yes. John says, what were the COVID variants used on these infected mice, any Omicron type? So here is a good news. It doesn't care for the variant because it is not a, it is not a blocker of spike protein or blocker of MPRO or 3CL-PRO or 
some other proteases of the enzyme, it actually changes the immune system of our system, our body. It changes the 82 cell pneumocytes of our lungs. It changes our inflammatory behavior. It makes our cells more potent to be able to handle the virus by changing the chloride efflux and calcium or the local environment of the cell. So it actually works on us instead of caring for the virus. That is a wonderful part. So this is a good question. Sky Frog is here. You're very welcome, Sky. Yes, thanks to those little mousies. Um, so yes, Mike, Michelle says this has implications for autoimmune like MS and RA. Yes, absolutely. If it is uh, modulatory, yes. Logic says, how do we temper T helper 17 for autoimmune diseases like how GBS is triggered by a viral infection? So there are many other mechanisms for that. Of course, always look at the empirical evidence, clinical evidence as well. We haven't reached a point clinically to be able to cure the autoimmune issues. That means despite all the molecules and all the drugs and researches, we still have gaps in our knowledge or we still have challenges in correctly balancing the immune system. So um, with this, there are so many questions. <laughs> so with this, let's stop. Sunset says, an internet search for GABA foods results in a good list of foods. Would eating these foods daily give us the studies benefit at all? So as the researchers said that this is a study done in mice, and human studies should be done. So I cannot say there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So I won't be able to say yes. However, many of these mechanisms work very similar between human and mice. The question is, what are the side effects? What are the doses? What is the uh, other therapeutics that need to be changed or not changed and so on. The general thing that I keep understanding is early treatment, aggressive early treatment is very important. And, and researchers say over here that vaccines have done a great job. Then they say there are antiviral therapeutics as well. But as we are seeing that vaccines, there are escape from vaccines the therapeutics are losing their efficiency as well. So as the new variants come in, and now this word is not theirs, it is mine, instead of chasing every variant to say, I'm going to make a vaccine for this, it is possible to start looking at those therapies that are more generic towards the virus, like GABA, instead of only looking towards one avenue. And this is a very similar message as I read from Dr. Al Ali, who had done the Veterans Affairs Hospital study that every reinfection is more severe. That author had said, I read that yesterday or, or Friday, where he was saying, we need to have a national level discussion to say what should be the approach to COVID because current approach is not working. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, not working. So Zainul Lamin says it is wise to take this report with a grain of salt. So here's the deal. It is a preprint mouse study. That is how it should be taken. So let's see. So John says, have, have FLCCC folks looked into this? I'm actually going to send it to Dr. Marek after this. And then I'm sure that Dr. Marek and I would have a discussion about this as well.
So uh, Robin says, what was the dose for humans? They said that dose that was used in mice, when translated to human, the human equivalent dose of GABA at 0.2 milligram per milliliter, assuming consumption of 3.5 milliliter per day water by the mouse, this converted to 0.68 gram per day for a 70 kilogram person, which is well within the level of known level known to be safe. Again, they are calculating this dose for future researchers and for, for those who would like to do clinical trials. John says, your doctors are awesome. Thank you very much. We are all awesome together. And today's heroes are the researchers of this uh, study. So thank you very much. Please do me a favor, like, subscribe, and share. And I would see you tomorrow with the next talk. Bye for now.